Good afternoon. Welcome to Reconnecting Brooklyn's History, Slavery and Abolition in Brooklyn. My name is Shirley brown Aline, and I'm the Manager of Education for the Center for Brooklyn's History. Thank you so much for participating with us tonight. Tonight, um, first I'd like to say that Brooklyn Public Library Center for Brooklyn History stands on land that is part of the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape Delaware people. For tonight's agenda, um, first I'm giving the welcome and overview and then at 4.05 approximately, um, Dr. Preeti Kanakamadela will give her talk on slavery and abolition in Brooklyn. And then afterwards, we will have Q&A and then wrap up surveys and CTLE. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A at the bottom of the screen and just put, the, put your question in there. If you have any questions, please put the Q&A, um, please press the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, at the end of this session, we will also be providing you with a link for a survey. We're asking everyone to please complete the survey. For any educators that are looking to receive a CTLE credit, please, please complete the survey and we'll use that in order for you to obtain your CTLE credit. However, we are asking everyone to please complete the survey as we are looking for ways to improve this series. Virtual housekeeping. If you, um, this particular session will be live streamed as well as, I mean, closed caption. So if you need um, any type of closed caption, please press closed caption at the bottom of the screen to CC and you will be able to see the transcript as it is happening. This session is being recorded. After this session is done in the next couple of days, it will be uploaded to our website. And teachers, we encourage you to please use the session as part of your classroom lessons, or you can use it as credit for in-person or virtual learning, however you choose. Code of conduct. Our events are intended to create a space that nurtures a community of educators that is inclusive of all, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender identity, religion, age, sexual orientation, ability, or stage of professional development. All attendees are expected to show respect to presenters, organizers, and other attendees. Actively listen, be sensitive, show support. Attendees who violate this code of conduct will be expelled. The Center for Brooklyn's History is located at 128 Pierpont Street. The Center, the Center for Brooklyn's History is a new entity, a little bit over a year old. It is the merger of the former Brooklyn Historical Society with the Brooklyn Public Library. Please feel free to visit us on our website. For those of you who are just joining us, if you look in the chat, we do have um, companion booklets for this for today's workshop wrap today's session, one for educators and one for students. And please feel free to join us for some of our upcoming Reconnecting Brooklyn's History, March 2nd with Dr. Julie Golia. We have Civil War Correspondence where we'll be looking at letters from Brooklyn to the Civil War um, battlefronts and learning about the people who wrote them. March 14th, Dr. Brian Purnell will be discussing Brooklyn Corps and the fight for justice. Andrew Gustafson of Turnstile Tours on April 7th will be discovering Brooklyn's home front during World War II. And author, writer, all around wonderful historian, Kenneth C. Davis will be discussing immigration on May 4th. Thank, thank you so much again for, for participating with us. And now I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Preeti Kanaka-Madela. She is an associate professor at Bronx Community College, 
a wonderful human being. And she was also the lead historian on the In Pursuit of Freedom exhibition website, which discussed slavery and abolition here in Brooklyn. She has done extensive work on these subjects, and we are very pleased and honored to have her talk today. Thank you very much, Dr. Kanakamadela. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. Um, thank you so much for choosing to spend sort of the next hour with us. Um, I know it's unseasonably warm today, so I do appreciate you might have had other options uh, than a normal February day. Um, I just wanted to thank the education team at Center for Brooklyn History, including the incomparable uh, Shirley Brown Aileen, who um, I've had the privilege of calling a colleague for many years. Um, and uh, just I'm always thrilled to be invited back um, to Center for Brooklyn History. Um, as Shirley said, and I'll just repeat, my name is Preeti Kanakamadala. I am an associate professor of history at Bronx Community College and also in the MALS program at the Graduate Center, both of the City University of New York. Prior to coming to CUNY, which was well over a decade ago, um, I worked as a historian for a public history project called In Pursuit of Freedom that brought together three cultural partners, Brooklyn Public Library, um, sorry, Brooklyn Historical Society, which is now Center for Brooklyn History, Brooklyn Public Library, uh, Weeksville Heritage Center, and Irondale Ensemble Project. Um, I was the historian for the larger project and also the curator for Brooklyn Abolitionists, which was at what was then Brooklyn um, Historical Society. And before I begin and kind of launch into slavery in Brooklyn and certainly anti-slavery activism, which went hand in hand, um, I just want to sort of uh, lay the scene slightly as to why Brooklyn. Um, for those of you who are extremely familiar with your New York City history, this might sound basic, but I'd like to make sure everybody's on a level playing field. Why Brooklyn? Well, Brooklyn was a separate city until consolidation in 1898. In other words, the time period I'm going to focus on for the next sort of 30 minutes, um, Brooklyn was its own entity. There was no five boroughs of New York City. It was its own city, its own mun municipality. So when I'm talking about Brooklyn for the next uh, half an hour or so, I really am talking about a place that was um, as peculiar and as independent and as separate as a city that we think of today, like Los Angeles or Philadelphia or Boston. Um, it had its own economy and it certainly had, um, as I mentioned, its own peculiar history to even neighboring Manhattan. Um, so I've given a various versions of this talk because this really has been my research focus for well over a decade now. And I usually start it with, you know, my, my talk or my narrative is going to begin at the end of a major chapter of US history, and that is the American Revolution. But I wanted to take a break from doing that today and to have us think about, especially because it is warm today, um, and because the pandemic has done so many things in terms of our relationship to space, our relationship to having to stay indoors, right? Isolation, quarantine, and our relationship to the ability to just go outdoors, outside, and walk. So I wanted you to think about the last walk you went on in your neighborhood. Think about who you saw, what it smelt like, what you heard, and start to invite you all to think about looking up and also looking down and really to slow down as you walk through your own neighborhoods. And my invitation to you is to think about what street do you live on? What neighborhood do you live in? Do you know the life history of that street or its genealogy? Do you know who the street or the neighborhood might be named after? Where does this naming come from? How is it we talk about um, street names uh, named after certain people and who gets to choose who those people are that it gets named after and who gets forgotten in that mix? As educators, we talk about primary sources a lot, right? And we um, focus on inquiry-based learning, document analysis, object analysis. So my invitation to you all as we sort of work our way through the semester and in the years to come as educators is to think about 
what's better than the best primary source there is, and that's our streets and our neighborhood and the landscape. Um, and the reason I'm asking you to do that is because Brooklyn and its history of slavery is embedded in its landscape. You don't really have to do much digging to think about what our relationship is um, to that of enslaved labor and its traumatic history. There's been a ton, and I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, there's been a ton of research um, and a ton of brilliant creative work that's been done in this area. So I just wanna sort of spend a few minutes to give a shout out to those artists and activists who are doing the work. Um, most of you, again, who are sort of New York history buffs, residents, um, and you know your Brooklyn history, will have heard of, of course, Slavers of New York, um, a three-person collective, um, brilliant activists, educators, artists, um, Ada Reso, um, Elsa Eli Waith, and Maria Robles, um, who've been creating these stickers since the end of 2020, definitely the beginning of 2021. Um, and they've been putting the stickers so effective, so simple, and been putting these stickers on various, um, this particular image that you can see here is obviously the Bergen subway stop, um, but putting it on street signs, putting it where they can, so that people in their rush to get from A to B really do understand the history of our streets. Where do these names come from? How is this, um, sort of an unresolved history and what is that legacy of slavery, which manifests itself in so many unjust ways, but it manifests itself visually in our landscapes. Um, there was a brilliant New York Times article about the three artist educators and I just sort of um, put it there, but I can put the hyperlink later in this talk um, into the chat. Um, so thinking about the ways in which our borough really does invite us to think about its history up front. <laughs> you don't really have to even go into the archives. The other um, source that I just wanted to shout out was Brooklyn by Name. Um, it has been um, part of my sort of reading collection for uh, some time now, near, near on just under two decades. Um, and it doesn't just focus on slavery, it actually focuses on where most of our streets get their names from. So I would highly recommend sort of these two sources to get you thinking in that direction. So having done that, um, I do wanna kind of go back to the lecture element of this. Slavery is embedded in our landscape um, where we've been cooped up for the last two and a half years of this horrific pandemic, and maybe you still are. Think about the ways in which we sort of missed out on our landscape a lot of time that we were indoors. But also the invitation really is to look up and look around. And now I am gonna start where my lecture normally starts, which is my story begins at the end of a chapter of US history, a major chapter, and that was the American Revolution. Even as patriots sort of decried their um, political enslavement and the tyranny of the British, in fact, the um, unresolved re uh, revolution itself, right, the incompleteness of it was that slavery still continued to exist in a land of freedom. Most of those founding fathers, um, most of those patriots were slaveholders themselves. And so when we look at um, slavery in Brooklyn, when we look at that first census that comes out, most of those names should look familiar. The first federal census was taken in 1790, just five years after the American Revolution ended. Um, and here on the left, you can see it's the heads of families um, and it is Kings County and it's broken down by sort of the different towns. Uh, there is Brooklyn, Bushwick, Flatbush, Flatlands, Gravesend, New Utrecht. Um, and just to give you some context, um, you really are thinking about Brooklyn as being developed but developed compared to Bushwick, Flatbush, Flatlands, Gravelands, and New Retract, which was extremely, extremely agricultural still. But it certainly was not the kind of um, downtown Brooklyn, um, sort of hyper-developed, gentrified, metro-tech Brooklyn we think of today, right? When I'm saying developed, all I mean by that is there were a few main streets, Main Street was one of them, 
there was the Fulton Ferry, um, and that was really it. It was still very much farmland. But you can clearly see that the breakdown of this is in terms of um, white um, head of households, uh, enslaved people, and all other free persons. And I often get asked, well, what does that all other free persons mean? It could mean a person of African descent. There really were free black uh, communities that existed, very small, clearly. Um, it could mean indigenous. Um, it could mean a few things. So, but my, my focus is really on the white males and the enslaved population. And to have you folks think about the numbers even by 1790, at the end of that revolution, when this country is founded upon liberty, independence, freedom, what you have in Kings County, again, think about Brooklyn as its own peculiar history, is something not necessarily unique, but unusual. Slavery was fortifying or growing or strengthening in Kings County in Brooklyn. And that was not the case in neighboring Manhattan. It wasn't even the case in Philadelphia and certainly not the case in Boston. So Kings County, because of its agricultural economy was already doing something different. And you can clearly recognize from the 1790 census, again, thinking about our landscape, thinking about what the way in which things look um, most of these streets still stand today. Sand Street, Remsen, Hicks, Nostrand, Borum Hill, um, uh, let's see, Cortellu, Cortellu Road, Wyckoff, so many Wyckoffs in Brooklyn, um, Lefferts, not just streets, but neighborhoods as well. Sort of a hat tip to the fact that these were the original Dutch and later English owning families that owned that land. Um, but also, um, memorialization of something that is unresolved in our histories right they were slave holders as property owners de facto they were also enslavers or slave holders and so thinking about the ways in which um our landscapes really are hidden and not so hidden at all and the ways in which they exist in our archives um, I just wanted to give a quick, quick shout out because I am talking about labor. This is a, a worksheet that's taken from the In Pursuit of Freedom curriculum guide. It is still freely available on the Center for Brooklyn History's website in the education section. Um, and just because it was a brilliant curriculum writer called Tracy Worley, who did a lot of this sort of taking my research and turning it into something, I did just want to give her a shout out because I know this worksheet has been shared, um, which I love across social media, but I just wanted to make sure that uh, Tracy's work was acknowledged and it, I was giving it, you know, kudos to the right sort of author. And why do we need to talk about slavery on our landscape? Yes, educators, absolutely. There are learning standards, there are state outcomes, I'm sorry, there are state uh, standards. There's the regions to prep for. Well, we need to talk about it because its legacy still exists around us today. It exists as anti-blackness, um, police brutality, certainly in our education system. The legacy exists as the huge amounts of segregation, inequality we see. Um, and as a CUNY professor, you know, I stand with you. I see it myself. But it's also um, important to talk about it because I would actually say I've been doing this talk for about a decade and it's changing. I don't know that our students need to know anymore that slavery existed. I think educators should be patting themselves on the back. Um, I think we've been doing our job. My students are certainly uh, at Bronx Community College not <coughs> surprised anymore that slavery existed. Um, they know it existed in New York. They know it existed in Brooklyn. But the reason we still need to keep talking about it in addition to all of those important reasons about legacy is because the myth still exists that slavery was somehow less or milder. Well, Professor Kanaka made a lift. It wasn't like the Southern plantations or Southern slavery. Maybe it was a better kind of slavery as if a better kind of slavery could exist. So I just want to read a primary source that builds into or um, sort of buys into that fallacy, right? That myth that somehow slavery could be milder or that slavery was somehow not as bad as it was in the South. Slavery was horrific and traumatic no matter what. 
Um, and I think when we're trying to think about nuance, it's really important to have both us as educators and also as uh, to also have our students think about nuance in absolutely particular ways, but this not being the way, right? So Aminto in um, 1796, obviously it's a pseudonym, writes, in some of the Northern states, particularly New York and New Jersey, where there are yet considerable numbers of slaves, their treatment is mild, if any slave can be said to receive mild treatment, compared with what they receive in the Southern states. They are generally well clothed and fed, and excessive whipping is often not inflicted on them. Neither are they obliged to work beyond their strength and are probably in no part of the world do slaves live so comfortable as here. Um, I think we need to pull this apart in the same way that we would any primary source. It's written in 1796. Um, clearly, clearly it is an apology or um, a sort of uh, pro-slavery piece. We know, thankfully, that slavery was horrific in Kings County because there was an enslaved person called John Jay, who we very sort of luckily have his um, first person account, his memoirs from, in which he will say that animals and the horses were treated better than us. And he also talks about his trauma, right? That slavery was almost so horrific that he still finds it difficult to talk about um, as he becomes a free man and starts traveling and sort of preaching the word of God through the Atlantic world. So I really, you know, I urge sort of obviously nuance as a historian when we think about slavery, both in Brooklyn and New York, but to really think about how we unpack that nuance and to think about, um, just creating a baseline in terms of language that slavery was horrific, even if a slaveholder only had right all of these qualifiers one to three enslaved people. Um, that was still brutal and that that kind of system of slavery and that brutality and that oppression still sort of um, has ripples in our society today. Just wanted to move on slightly to three key dates that um, are sort of key or pivotal to um, this narrative. And those are the dates in which slavery ended in New York State. Uh, the three dates are 1799, which is the date of the Gradual Emancipation Act, 1817, which was a further act, and the final end of slavery, 1827, July 4th. In 1799, New York State, again, incredibly reluctant to end slavery, passed the Gradual Emancipation Act. And it stated, if you were born after July 4th, 1799, and you were male, you were an enslaved male, you would be free at the age of 28. And if you were born after July 4th, 1799, and if you were female, you would be free at the age of 25. If you were born before, born before rather, July 4th, 1799, slavery had no end date for you as an enslaved person. So to have yourselves as educators and your students thinking about the ways in which New York State and New York and certainly Brooklyn really did hold on to slavery, it took 28 oppressive years for slavery to end. And when it did, there were very few enslaved people waiting to be freed, right? The idea that enslaved people really sort of grabbed their own freedom. Um, in 1817, when the writing was on the wall and New York State could clearly see slavery was on the wane throughout the North, other Northern states that are actually um, precedented in terms of when slavery would end. New Jersey was the only last one after New York to end slavery. Um, in 1817, New York finally gives it that end date of July 4th, 1827. And again, on July 4th, 1827, we thankfully have um, various accounts, the most famous of which is, which is James McCune Smith, who would later become an abolitionist and a doctor, one of the only male doctors um, in the early 19th to mid 19th century here in New York. And he'll talk about that beautiful parade on, along Broadway in Lower Manhattan um, and how people were really excited to see the end of slavery, but actually, that there was a growing free black community 
And I am not saying freed with a D on the end, but it was a growing free black community that had existed in New York throughout gradual emancipation. And those folks, certainly the thriving small free black community in Brooklyn, were not waiting for an emancipation moment. Rather, again, they seized those moments throughout the 28 years to create freedom and moments of emancipation throughout those 28 years and beyond from this for themselves. As long as slavery existed, so did the desire to be free. It goes hand in hand. And nowhere did you see this more than in Brooklyn's small, extremely small, but thriving free black community. So this free black community lived in what we call um, today Dumbo, didn't exist then, it was still the village of Brooklyn, um, certainly Vinegar Hill, tiny, tiny bit of downtown Brooklyn and an even tinier bit of Brooklyn Heights. It was a free black community, a number of men and women at the center of that. But the men would come together, two brothers that I always focus on, James and Peter Kroger, and that they would create these three pillars of what any community should look like, any sort of healthy, thriving community should look like. The first thing they formally create in terms of an institution is the Brooklyn African Woman Benevolence Society. This is the, just the cover page um, from the Constitution, which is actually printed 10 years later. Um, but the organization itself is printed in 1810. Um, we're talking about a time in Brooklyn's economic history and actually neighboring New York's as well, in which people of African descent were denied the opportunity to get jobs that reflected their talents and capabilities. Right, a white supremacist system, a racial, um, a racist system, and racial capitalism made sure that when you look at the census, a number of people of African descent, of Black New Yorkers, Black Brooklynites, were often doing jobs um, that were certainly um, sort of uh, uh, working class jobs, laborers, construction workers, dock workers. Um, occasionally, you would find absolutely, as the 19th century progressed, educators, um, businessmen and women. But the far majority of Black Brooklynites lived below the poverty line. And so, again, as part of self-determination, they created institutions in which they could thrive and survive as a community. And so the Brooklyn African Woman Benevolent Society is the first mutual aid society here in Brooklyn. There's one in neighboring New York as early as 1808. Uh, the New York um, African Society for Mutual Relief, but this was slightly different. This was created so that if you were um, a widow or an orphan of a member um, who had paid their dues, you would receive the monies to make sure you didn't go under the poverty um, line. And so thinking of ways in which in an incredibly capitalist system, right, in which racial capitalism will always sort of um, foreground white supremacy, thinking of ways in which this free black community was looking to not just survive, but thrive as a community. So that was the first thing they create in 1810. In 1815, just five years later, again, these two brothers, Peter and Benjamin Kroger, will put an advertisement in the Long Island Star. At this point in Brooklyn's history, it was um, part of Long Island still. It was Kings County in Long Island because of the, um, the geography or the, the, the shape of the land. So he puts an advertisement in the Long Island Star for an African school. And it clearly says a day and evening school is now opened at the house of Peter Kruger or Kroger in James Street, Brooklyn, where those who wish may be taught the common branches of education. Again, not waiting for emancipation or freedom to be handed in any way, but just seizing it for themselves. This was a free black community that knew education was central right to freedom literacy is liberation education is emancipation. And so Peter Kroger goes ahead and opens it in his house and thinking about our landscapes and the way in which stuff is erased constantly. Um, New York is, you know, a city of development always has been um, my esteemed colleague Cynthia Copeland, a public historian, says it best when she says we are constantly as New Yorkers walking upon 
other New Yorkers who came before us, their lives, the remnants of their lives. And so James Street in downtown Brooklyn doesn't exist today. When they started building or constructing the Brooklyn Bridge, um, James Street was raised um, and there was no memorial or no plaque put to them. Um, so an African school. So by 1815, you had a mutual aid organization to think about income. How can a family in which maybe the breadwinner has deceased, how can they survive? You then had education as emancipation, right? Let's create a private school in which we know our children and not just children, but adults too, can get an education in which they may be taught some of the same debates happening today, a curriculum that really reflects our needs and educators that reflect our students. The next pillar that they create for this strong community is um, by 1818, they will borrow from Philadelphia um, and uh, create the Bridge Street. It wasn't called Bridge Street yet. In 1818, it was still very much the African Methodist Church. It will later become the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And then it will move to Bridge Street um, and be called the full name. Of course, today, Bridge Street is still thriving. Um, it has since moved from downtown Brooklyn, um, but remains one of our oldest churches today in Brooklyn. Um, so thinking about those three pillars of um, a sort of energized, mobilized, organized, thriving free black community, thinking about it in terms of assistance, education and faith and not just thinking about those spaces as um standalone or independent right you, you you went to the church to pray you went to the school to get an education but actually to think of these spaces in which real estate has always been premium in brooklyn and new york um the fight for real estate, the fight for who gets remembered on that land has always been central to Brooklyn's history. And so thinking and looking to um, for inspiration of ways to organize and mobilize today, thinking of that free black community in early 19th century Brooklyn, in which nothing is set in stone yet, so to speak, pardon my pun, um, the streets are still being created. What kind of town are we going to look like and certainly by 1834 what kind of city are we going to look like um is still up for grabs um sure there are white people who are like this is what kind of city we're going to be but in which the free black community is really committed to growing that neighborhood and growing their streets in their own anti-slavery vision and so what i mean by all of this is we know at bridge street african methodist episcopal church um, they will have classes when the um, school at Pre Peter Kroger's home just sort of outgrows itself. It's, it's too big for his um, small abode. They will move the classes to the basement of Bridge Street and uh, children and adults get educated there. Out of that, it grows again. They will move to African Hall on Nassau Street. Again, none of this exists. Um, and from there, again, they will become um, Colored School Number One, right? The African school in downtown Brooklyn will be renamed Colored School Number One. And thinking about legacy and landscape, uh, its legacy and landscape still um, is with us today, thankfully. It is PS67, the Charles A. Dorsey School in Fort Greene. Again, the church was not just a place of faith. It was not just a place of education. It was also a place in which Black Brooklynites could congregate and think about voting drives because, of course, not everybody had the right to vote in 19th century Brooklyn or New York. Um, for Black men, there was a $250 um, requirement or prerequisite of land or property in order to be able to vote. White men did not have that. And so these spaces become places in which free Black men and women and certainly children in training to become activists as they become older, think about how to get the right to vote. They think about if we need $250 worth of property in order to vote, how do we get on that real estate ladder? How do we make connections? And so, of course, again, if you know Brooklyn's history, you know this, most of the early land investors, the original land investors in Weeksville lived in what we call today downtown Brooklyn. Um, Sylvanus Smith is one of them. Uh, Henry C. Thompson, who's involved with Colored School Number One, would be another land investor. 
but it is James Weeks, um, who will be one of the early land investors and the only one to live in Weeksville, from which it gets its name, um, that will move. So thinking about not just um, organizing to get on the property ladder, and that had huge implications because it meant the right to vote, not just thinking about faith and education and assistance as separate categories, um, but also thinking about the ways in which um, education really can be a catalyst or a um, crucible for so many other things. We have a long history in 19th century Brooklyn and of course, it's something different today, and it has a slightly different history today's um, uh, celebration. But throughout early and uh, mid 19th century Brooklyn, we have the West India Day emancipation celebrations. Those were often led by educators. Um, and they were beautiful sort of ceremonial things in which they would have the children walk through often open spaces. So they would go out to Queens or go out to sort of closer to Weeksville um, and really celebrate black identity, right? Again, making connections, not just as New Yorkers, but thinking about a black Atlantic, thinking about celebrating what does black freedom look like in the Western world. And so every August 1st, West India Day emancipation celebration, looking to um, the Caribbean and thinking about what those celebrations might have looked like. It's in all of the newspapers. If you look in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle or the Long Island Star, um, which has been digitized and is available at Center for Brooklyn History, um, you can actually see these celebrations and they occurred fairly regularly. It was an annual thing. Um, we just don't have the records for each annual event. William J. Wilson, who will become the longest serving educator at what will become Colored School Number no. One, um, often led most of these events. So thinking again about educators as activists, um, educators as just today were doing multiple roles. Um, they were building their communities. They were serving as leaders in the church. They were also um, uh, writing for various newspapers. William J. Wilson, again, was a journalist um, and writing as um, a pseudonym, Ethiop talking extensively in 1850 about the black economy how the black community in brooklyn needs to seize this opportunity in 1850 as this city is growing and expanding and they should seize um, commercial opportunities along atlantic um, you know, and he sort of urges black men and women to take business opportunities, grow businesses. And this is an educator talking. That is not how he made his bread and butter. But he does do a beautiful shout out to his wife, um, Mary Wilson, who owned um, a clothing store along Atlantic and into Fulton. So again, thinking about education as a site of emancipation, thinking about educators as activists, and thinking about the ways in which during that gradual emancipation period going into 1850, nobody in Brooklyn, or certainly nobody in that free black community was waiting for slavery to end by 1827. But thinking about the ways in which that free black community was constantly um, sort of organizing, um, mobilizing, and thinking of ways in which um, they should really kind of get together to fight white supremacy head on. That was a pattern, those three pillars of community building, assistance, education, and faith that would really take um, Black activism in Brooklyn through to Reconstruction and beyond. Um, so thinking about a pattern or a blueprint for which um, activism sort of worked in 19th century Brooklyn. So again, I just want to return to the beginning where I invited you all to think about your streets. Think about your streets and think about who is commemorated and who is not. To think about um, do our streets mostly commemorate sort of extremely difficult and oppressive parts of our history, or do they commemorate the activists the organizers who pushed our borough um, into to, and shaped it into something slightly different. Um, thank you so much. This is going to conclude the talk element of today's session. Um, my email address is up there. I'm also happy to put it in the chat, but I would like to stop the presentation bit and I would love to hear sort of your questions um, and comments uh, just for what we have left of today's talk. Thank you.
Oh, Shirley. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> okay, sorry. I thought it had unmuted, so I apologize. Thank you, Preeti. That was a wonderful presentation. And yes, for those of you who have questions, please use the Q&A at the bottom. But we do have a question. Preeti, it says, in pursuit of freedom was created after New York City failed to confiscate and demolish the home of Mama Joy Chattel on, I hope I said that correct, I apologize if I didn't, at 227 Duffield Street. Can you talk about how her legacy of activism impacted this presentation? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for the invitation to talk about it. Um, none of this would be here. I would not be here speaking to you. Um, the the concept and the project would not have existed at all if it had not been for the late Joy Chattel. Um, Joy Chattel's home at 227 Duffield, which um, you can go research it, has been um, an ongoing struggle to think about who gets remembered and who doesn't um, in Brooklyn. Um, so I certainly owe a debt um, to the late Joy Chattel, who tragically never got to see sort of the fruits of her activist labor really come um, you know, out, uh, the, the project would not exist. The reason In Pursuit of Freedom really does exist is because in terms of this iteration, um, is because Joy Chattel argued that her home was part of the Underground Railroad and therefore the city turned around and said, okay, we'll research it. And that goes through many, many iterations, which you can see online, um, which you can Google rather. So again huge shout out to joy chattel um and to all the black women honestly that have been at the center of this activism thinking historically about the black women at the center of sort of early mid and late 19th century activism um but also thinking about dr joan maynard who was central to activist efforts to revive or put weeksville back on the map um, I feel as though this is what happens with Black history and our landscapes. Um, we have the original history, right, the stuff that I'm talking about, and then we have a second history. It is what exactly what ha happened with the African burial ground, in which activists, um, uh, residents, uh, community researchers will sort of put that history back on the map, and then all of us stand on their shoulders. Um, this research, you know, the way in which research works, I put my name on it, but I know I'm standing on the shoulders of so many folks who came through the 60s and 70s who were writing about this history. Um, there's a historiography to it. So yes, absolutely. Um, Joy Chattel, always at the center of everything sort of I talk about when I talk about this history. Thank you. Great. Okay, next question is, May you speak to the components of activism that you outlined? How did activists come together to plan and progress monitor? Thank you so much. So the three pillars that I laid out were assistance, education, and faith. Um, and exactly like I said, they came together. And again, it's scraps of archives that we're looking at. Um, they came together because um, they lived together, right? They were they were neighbors, they were residents, uh, sometimes neighbors just across the street or neighbors next door to each other, or they were all residents of the village of Brooklyn, um, residents of the town of Bushwick, um, the village of Williamsburg. And so the ways in which they overlap is um, sort of what I was talking about. They all had multiple hats in the way that educators have multiple hats today. Um, nobody was just sort of going into the school, teaching a class and coming home. Far from it, they were very much invested in their communities. And so to take William J. Wilson, for example, who's the longest serving educator at what will become college school number one, that original school, um, He's an educator, he's a journalist, he is um, a church leader, um, and you know, obviously also a businessman, and he's an activist, he's an abolitionist, he's calling for the end, immediate end to slavery. Um, so thinking about, I think again, spaces in which they would have naturally just come together and spoken. And also thinking about activism, I think, as it's never just a, a, a one or a single issue, is it, right? Activists are brilliant people <laughs> because they see the injustice and take on multiple issues at the same time. Um, you know, 
our housing situation is very much tied into education. Our education situation is very much tied into um, our voting situation. And so thinking maybe today about displacement gentrification, um, it's never like a single issue. It is an issue I think that activists, residents, um, community members take on in a, like a multi-pronged fashion. Okay, our next question says, to what extent was Brooklyn abolitionist culture influential on a national or international stage? Sure, so Brooklyn was the third largest city by the start of the Civil War, so it had a huge impact on the national stage. Um, in terms of just thinking about racial capitalism and the economy, uh, it was uh, the provider, sorry, it was the, um, it provided sugar in the most amount, right? Sugar came out of Brooklyn. Um, there's a reason the Domino Sugar Factory was on that Williamsburg waterfront for so many years. That is how this borough grew from that tiny town to just like a city to being the third largest city in the United States. So in terms of national economy, it's key. And it's that sugar economy. If you're thinking about anti-slavery activism, though, again, that network was crucial. Uh, it was crucial because um, those activists, again, and organizers do it today, you know, organizers will go hyper-local, but they will also go regional and national. Those Black activists that were living in Brooklyn were always making regional and national um, connections. Um, how could they not, right? In order to um, help Black brothers and sisters in the South who were still enslaved, they would have to, um, you could help them by certainly the networks of the Underground Railroad, right? You could escape via um, not so much tunnels or attics, but you could actually um, escape via um, or run to freedom via networks, networks of people. Go to somebody in Philadelphia, they will help you. From Philadelphia, that person's gonna help you come to Brooklyn and you can start a new life. Um, so certainly that was one way. The other way, which we know with a man called James Hamlet in 1850, is they, they would also fundraise together. So thinking about ways in which to literally purchase somebody out of enslavement in the South um, so that they could become a free person and come North. Um, so yes, absolutely, Brooklyn is part of this national story. Um, and I think to tell the story of abolitionism or to even tell the story of slavery um, without Brooklyn or to suggest that it was just Manhattan and not Brooklyn, I think we undertell um, to a severe amount, the real or the nuanced history of this. Okay, one last, oh, wait, there's one other question that just popped up. Um, there were important black abolish, ab abolitionists, but Henry Ward Beecher was the most famous man in America, America to just to quote the recent biography of him, which is true. Yeah, I can only ask one more question, which I'm going to answer, which I'm going to ask, which is from AJ Blanford. Can you tell us more about education in Brooklyn during the 19th century? What other education opportunities were there other than African schools? Thank you so much. So of course there was a school district and there was a there was a school system, right? The district schools, um, which will later get taken over by the Brooklyn Board of Education. Um, the reason I focus on those African schools is because for a long time they um, racism meant or dictated that they operated outside the system. When you look at the Long Island Star in um, 1814, it says. Um, we're opening a new district school here in the village of Brooklyn, um, and it sets out all of its terms, and it says it's even going to be hosted in a print shop, um, which again no longer exists. But its last line or its footnote is, um, quote unquote, colored children will not be received at this time. So my focus on the African schools in Brooklyn is to say the history for the education system in Brooklyn as a whole is out there, right? That is the official history of Brooklyn. If you open up sort of Henry Stiles, who was our official historian, 19th century historian, if you open up newspapers, all of the schools are listed. Um, by highlighting the African schools, what I hope to really be talking about is self-determination, what do you do um, as a community of color when you are sort of being forgotten about 
by white supremacy, when you're being forgotten about by racial capitalism? Um, what does that historic narrative look like um, in terms of just creating opportunities for your own? So um, in terms of the education system in Brooklyn, every district or ward had a school um, and there were uh, less of the African schools. There were only four and then five, and then they all disappear when um, the Brooklyn Board of Education kind of takes them over. And the other part of the question, the last last question, which is how did desegregation in 1883 change the, change the neighborhood? Thank you so much. That's a great question. And one that I'm slowly getting to. Um, I'll be dead honest, my research stops <laughs> at 1865. And I've always let sort of other historians or other scholars do that. Um, Carla Peterson talks beautifully about what desegregation looked like. Um, and certainly for the careers of uh, Maricha Lyons, um, other black women such, such as um, Sarah Smith, um, Tompkins Garnett. Um, so I don't want to steal away from them. And, you know, I always just want to sort of shout out other scholars work anyway. Um, I do think we should all go and look at Black Gotham by Carla Peterson, who lays it out. The other book that I would tell urge you all to go look at, especially if you're looking for that late 19th century educational stuff, um, is Craig Stephen Wilder's book, Covenant with Color. Um, and I'm incredibly excited that historian um, Brian Pinnell will also be putting something out soon. Um, I think it's coming out this summer. Um, so not that I don't want to talk about it, but I would, it's been written about and I would much rather, you know, sort of shout out other scholars and their work. Thank you, Preeti. This was wonderful. And I see from the, from the chat that a lot of people have appreciated um, your talk and your time. And I'd like to say thank you very much for participating with us today. And I'd also like to say to all of you who have participated, teachers, students, thank you so much for participating with our Reconnecting Brooklyn's History. This is our very first session, and this is the first time we've ever done this. So I'm really excited. Again, please come join us for our other Reconnecting Brooklyn's History about Civil War Correspondence, Brooklyn Corps with Dr. Brian Burnell, um, Brooklyn's World War II home front, as well as immigration with, Ken, with Kenneth Davis. Thank you. Um, we also like to say that the Center for Brooklyn's History is also hosting New York City History Day. Yes, we are hosting New York City History Day and registration is open now and it closes on the 28th. So if you're interested, please visit our website or email us for more information. There's also more information in your booklet. And again, it, um, we are asking everyone to please fill out the survey. Please feel free to click on the link or use the QR code to access the survey. Um, this survey will be able to help us um, learn about how you felt about, the, about this particular talk and other talks you may want to see, other sessions of Reconnecting Brooklyn's History and how we can be able to help teachers in the classroom and as well as, well as help students like you who are here to understand the history by introducing you to scholars who have done the research and have done the, have done the work to find out the information for you, okay? Okay, the link is not working. We will also be emailing out the link if it's not working um, for the survey. And again, if you're, look, if you're a teacher and you like CTLE credit, please complete the survey. And there's a section in there for the CTLE from the Center for Brooklyn's History Education Department. Thank you. And on behalf of the Brooklyn Public Library, I'd like to say thank you so much for participating with us. Have a wonderful evening. Preeti, that was great. I'll call you in about 10 minutes because now we're being kicked out the building. I'll talk to you later.